All right, so static equilibrium, special application of Newton's first law. Right, and so I, I forget where this bridge is, but I thought this was a really um, impressive example of civil engineering feat. Um, I think it's in Australia, I think it's in Sydney, if I remember right. Um, but when you guys drive, drive across, across bridges, we don't really want them to be moving, right? Now they, they definitely, just like with, um, with your house, you don't really want your house to be moving. If you, if you remember, it was about 10 years ago when we had that one earthquake, um, it was actually the first year Patriot opened up and it was before school started. And at that time, my brother and I, I, I built, I was a general contractor, but we built my house and we, we built a big addition basically because I had built something just for me when I was single before Dakota came along. Um, and so we built onto the house and it just so happened to be the moment the earthquake hit, my brother and I were at the, we were in the upstairs at the point where the two, the new house was attaching to the old house. And we were using this big saw because we had to cut something and he he was doing it at the time and then both both parts of the house shook it just happened to be the, the weirdest timing and we thought we were breaking something like holy cow what are you what are you cutting that's going to make the house fall did not realize at the time that it was actually the earthquake um, it was just one of those funny things that happened just at the right moment and we obviously sprinted out of the house not knowing what was going on, right? But we don't want our house to move. We don't want bridges to move, right? And so you don't want the school to move when you're walking around the school. Um, so we build these things to be in static equilibrium. Um, so they're not going to move at all. Um, and so civil engineers, that's one of their main features and functions is, is figuring out based on what are the live loads and the dead loads, um, you know, like a dead load would be like snow on top of a roof, right? That's not a moving load, but cars driving over a bridge, that, that's more of a live load. Um, but in the end, we want this thing to stay in equilibrium. Um, and so unfortunately now, which for me, as I told you guys, we don't do waves anymore. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys what I'm talking about, what we don't want to happen. because I usually show this video um, when we do waves and you may have seen it before. As you can see, this bridge was exceptionally long and narrow, over half a mile long, only 39 feet wide. It lasted just- Dad, we long. can't see it. We can't see it? All right, hold on. I think I, for, I, I didn't hit, um, I thought I hit share, but it must not have stuck. You see it now? When I do it full screen, does it make it bigger on your screen too or no? It does? Yeah. All right, so this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It's, it's uh, in Tacoma, Washington. This happened, as you can see, in the 40s. Um, it didn't last very long. And there's other very famous bridge collapse, the Silver Bridge, which is in, um, it's in West Virginia. I think it spans between West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, there's a couple other bridges that are very similar to this, um, but it's very interesting. There, um, the design of this has been used in other bridges that are working fine. It just so happens to be this, this one and a couple others didn't. 2,800 feet, 40 feet wide. But this is the impressive thing. The, the steel beams on the side that actually broke are eight feet um, tall, right? That's, that's, a, that's a huge beam. During construction, yeah, we see the feet. steel girders, eight feet tall, which were supposed to stiffen the bridge against the bending. However, some up and down vibration was observed during the entire useful life of the bridge. Here's opening day. Here's 
here's where things go bad. On November 7th, the bridge suddenly went into a twisting motion. The wind speed was a steady 42 miles per hour. This was enough to keep the bridge oscillating in one of its natural modes of vibration with a period of five seconds. There's, and I don't know if you can see it. A professor of engineering went out to see what had happened. Yeah. He's coming back, walking with some difficulty, along the nodal line, which is the center stripe of the roadway. So he, it's Mr. Farquharson, I believe was his name. He went out one morning because, uh, you know, they realized this, this had been going on and people were driving over it. They called it Galloping Gertie. Um, well, one morning he, for some reason, he was drawn to go to the bridge. It was like five or so in the morning, he drove out there. Now. I don't remember if the, there's tons of videos of this online and I have the original seven minute video on cassette that I would always show you guys. But, and so I don't know if this, if there, there's a tearjerker to this movie because that morning he happened to bring his daughter's dog with him and he drove out to the middle of the bridge. You can see how much, how hard it is for him to walk because that's not supposed to happen. Again, eight foot steel beams are, is moving like that. Like that's a very- It's remarkable rigid. that the girders were this flexible. This is photographed at normal speed. However, a collapse was inevitable after a little more than an hour of this. You can still see him running right here. It looks like he's sitting right there, which I don't know why he'd be sitting. The car had been abandoned earlier. No one was injured in the whole affair. However, a small dog in the car was frightened and was afraid to come out, and he perished along with the bridge. Again, remember these are eight foot steel beams that's moving like that. If you've been on 66, all those construction, look at those beams they're, they're using for the bridges. Now there's a lot of oscillations here, right? So that's a lot of wave stuff, a lot of The bridge was motion. rebuilt using a stiffening truss instead of girders. The new bridge is completely stable. They ended up by building a new one about a mile away. So that's kind of like the, um, the official, oops, I need to get rid of that. How can I get it? Their official video that the guy made that, um, they had the one guy that went out there on the bridge was one of the engineers, but it just so happened to be that one of the newspaper guys is the guy that filmed it all. He happened to have that just, I don't know, whatever, for whatever reason, they woke up that morning and they're like, I'm going to go out to the bridge, see what's going on. Like, that's not something you would normally think about, but it was a pretty special bridge because of its motion and people were driving across it for, you know, I think it was about a year or so. Um, but for a while. Um, and so we have, you know, so and you saw that thing oscillate back and forth. And there's some what we call simple harmonic motion there, meaning motion like a grandfather clock that goes back and forth at the same period. Period is the time for it to repeat itself. And they mentioned in that video about it moving back and forth with a period of five seconds. That means it swung one way and back every five seconds, or in that case, it was going like this. And so 
This twisting part, right, is a torsional, um, comes from the idea of torque, but it's a rotational equilibrium. So we don't want things to be moving side to side, up and down, but we also don't want them to twist, right? And that bridge had all of that going on. We aren't gonna look at the rotational stuff yet, right? That's really more when we get into the rotational after we do circular motion. Uh, but that's the other condition for static equilibrium is things can't be twisting either. Now, all these pictures are hyperlinked to different versions of that same, same video. Uh, but this one is the idea that if it's in rotational equilibrium, the torques would equal zero. And so that means this is how we do torque. Um, I believe that's tau, right? The Greek letter. I think it's the small case letter for T in the Greek. I think they called that one tau. Um, but that's usually how we write the sum of the torques equaling zero. But we're just not going to, we're not going to need that quite yet. We're just going to look at the forces. So when an object's in translational equilibrium, right? That's X and Y linear. The net force on it has to be zero. So we're just looking at that, which is just Newton's first law. And so we're, that's why it's kind of really just an application of Newton's first law. Systems in static equilibrium if the net external force, outside force, resultant forces are zero and the torques, right? There's a better version of that. So these are both conditions to make static equilibrium. We're just gonna look at this one for right now. We'll come back to this one when we get into circular motion and twisting motions. And so um, that's kind of a summary slide. This is what we're looking at now. So again, we got to look at the forces in the X direction, the forces in the Y direction, make our two equations um, to make translational static equilibrium. And so the next, there, and there wasn't a lot of notes to this uh, pre-lesson, but I kind of broke it down into the steps to solve static equilibrium problems. I kept this, I think this was also in the pre-lesson because the, a ladder, this happens all the time. I'm sure you've been on a ladder. This is a phi. Instead of using theta, they used phi in this diagram, right? But you're leaning the ladder up against the wall. So obviously there's forces acting on the, the ladder wall system here, the ground ladder system here, and then the ladder itself. And so it's a pretty complex force diagram, right? And so looking at something like this, it's kind of beyond what we're going to be doing with physics, but an engineer would look at that and you'd have to look at how can I calculate these forces? Um, and you can see like, here's friction, here's the normal force because that's where it's touching. Here's a normal force because it's touching there. It's got to be perpendicular. Obviously there's a pull of gravity on the ladder. And so you've got forces in the X plane and the Y plane and you got to resolve them all together and set up the equations and then you can solve for the different forces. I mean, a lot of times you can see like here, this they call this phi, this is 90 minus phi, right? The Just trying to figure out the angles from your geometry days is the tricky part. Um, I don't think we're gonna get to a problem that maybe is that complicated. Um, and then you, because especially this one, you'd have to include some of the torques. So what when we look at torques, we, we try to find a pivot point. And so we could say, if this was going to, to move, right, it could pivot around this point, meaning the ladder, which obviously wouldn't happen, could go up because it would be going against gravity. That would be impossible. But what, if, if you were on the ladder, if uh, the forces weren't balanced, this, this thing could start to go this way, right, as you're climbing up it. So that would be the pivot point at which we would then look at um, for the torques or the, in engineering, what we call the moments. Right, and so there's another layer of difficulty or complexity to this. Here, if you think about if you, if nobody probably really does this much anymore, but in the old days, you used to have a clothesline and you'd let your clothes air dry, right? Or if you go camping, one of the big thing is um, you put a line across two trees and then you hang your food, right? So that the animals can't get at it. Um, and so same with what you're seeing here, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> you know, with this kind of um, chain or rope, it's always gonna sag because the, the pull of gravity on this girl is 490 Newtons. If it was straight across, there would be no force up to counteract 490 Newtons. So unless it's a steel beam, right, which has different type of rigidity to it, but if it was any kind of rope or chain or, you know, braided cable, 
it's always going to sag because you have to have some force in the y direction to count to counteract this 490 newtons. Um, and so you'd have the x component this way and a y component this way. Um, but that's why it's always going to sag, right? And this, if you guys go hiking or whatever, camping, right? This is what you do. So the bears and the raccoons and the fox and whatever doesn't get your food, you put it up here. But again, it's gonna, it's always gonna sag um, because there's a vertical force acting on it. And so if this object is horizontal, it, it needs to have an, a vertical force to counteract the force of gravity. And that's why it does sag. So here was the steps. Normally I would like, in, if we were in school, I would give you this, pa this pa uh, page already kind of written out. So you would just have them. Cause this is the steps, the thought process to any static equilibrium problem. The first step is, is kind of one of those things that we do when we, we kind of just do it and we overlook that we're doing it, but you have to choose a set of axes. So what that means is how do you want X and Y to be? Normally it's gonna be what we were, we're used to. But remember I talked about with inclined planes, instead of having X like this and Y like this, what we do for certain types of problems is we make the incline X. Um, and we can do that for other types of problems. The reason why we do that though, is because we wanna make it so we have to um, find the X and Y component for the least amount of forces. Um, Cause it just makes it easier to solve those problems when we do it for a smaller amount of forces. Then you wanna draw your force diagram for that point where the forces all converge upon um, or where they act. Then you have to find the components of all the forces acting on the body. If, if there's any that are not exactly in the X or Y direction. And then we add all the X's together and we add all the Y's together. You're going to get, the idea is you're going to get two equations um, and you've got to get it down to two unknowns because um, you're probably going to have more than two unknowns. And then, so what that means is that's where we're going to come in with our trig functions. Um, and so we're going to end up by doing, um, you know, f of x possibly equaling f cosine of theta, f of y equaling f sine of theta as, um, and now there's, so when, even though I write it like this, this is not an always rule. Um, Fy is not always F sine of theta. It, it just depends on, are you taking theta with respect to the X axis or the Y axis, right? If you do it that way, that's true. But if we were to, to go this way, then these two trig functions would flip flop. Right, so don't just memorize that and say, well, Doc wrote that, it's always true. It's not always true. It just depends on what angle is given or what angle you use. But these two steps are important in us. If we end up with four unknowns in these two equations, chances are we're gonna need to use th this trig uh, relationship to go from four unknowns down to two unknowns. Because if you have two equations, you can only have two unknowns. Right, and so, we're gonna simplify it down to two equations with, I'm not really sure why, why I have that slide there other than as a review. So those are the steps. And I really think for the most part, it's it, for this particular type of thing, there's not a lot of concepts to it, right? We're just applying Newton's first law. So it's best just do a bunch of examples. Um, and so I've, I think I have two or three different examples here but I'll, we'll try to work through a couple of them or I'll do a couple and then maybe you can do one and I'll do it after you guys to see if you got the idea. Um, we, in the end, we won't have a, a quiz on this because if we're, if we're only doing, we're kind of a quiz behind a concept, but it'll be, you know, be a little bit on your test on Tuesday. This was a, I think you already had this force diagram. Um, this was, before, before I taught AP physics, I taught IB physics at Stonewall. And so for 18 years, we did a lot of stuff like what that's AP caliber in the second year physics class. And this was one of their, on one of their uh, tests. And this, this force diagram really throws people for a loop. Um, you got a fire helicopter carrying 620 kilogram bucket, right? They're using it to put out the fires probably. Um, it's moving at a constant speed of 40 meters per second. So our things are either not gonna be moving or moving at a constant speed, right? No acceleration yet. The cable makes an angle of 40 with respect to the vertical. Um, determine the force exerted by air resistance on the bucket. 
Now, it doesn't, right? It doesn't say um, we're in a vacuum here because it tells you we want to know what is that force of air resistance. Um, so this is the thing. This is the object that we're looking at, right? And so we want to draw the forces acting on the bucket. So there's a rope here that's acting in this direction. So you could call that F, you could call it tension, right? It's it's a force of tension because it's a rope pulling on the bucket. Um, it's up to you. So you could call it T or FT. Obviously there's the force of gravity always, right? You can call that FG or you can call it W, whichever you like. But this is not an equilibrium here, right? If you take these two forces and add them together, there's no way for that to equal zero. So there must be another force acting on it. And so, and why would this bucket not be straight underneath? Because if there was no air resistance, this thing would be right here, right? There's nothing to push it to the left. So there must be a force that's pushing it to the left. Otherwise it would just go straight underneath. And so it's that air resistance force, right? And you can call it friction if you want, or you can call it FA for air resistance. AR, it, you know, again, it's whatever you want it to be. But that's my force diagram. Um, and what was the other thing? The cable makes an angle of 40 degrees with respect to the vertical. So what they're giving me here is this angle is 40. Right? So now that's important only when you decide to do the trig step because this angle, I can't draw that very well, this angle obviously is 50. So you have to decide which angle you want to use and how you want to break this force of tension into its X and Y component. So what, what I normally do, so when you draw your force diagram, you shouldn't draw anything but the, the, the real forces acting on the bucket. But now, if, you, if it helps you solve the problem better, you can either draw a new force diagram where you add the components or you just break, because this, is, this isn't this is a negative um, X, this isn't a negative Y, right? There's no component to them, they're perfect. But the tension force acts in both directions. So you may want to do just the tension force and then you got to decide, do you want to go this way and this way to make your right triangle? So this would be TX and this would be TY and you would use the angle of 50 or, and it doesn't matter which way you do it, do you want to go this way to make your triangle and then go this way? Right, it's the same triangle where this is TX, this is TY, and this angle is 40. Now, what happens here? Well, if you want to solve for TX using my blue triangle, 40 is opposite TX, right? And so that's sine. If you want to use my red triangle, um, TX is adjacent to the angle and that's cosine. Well, it turns out that the sine of 40 is equal to the cosine of 50, right? And so it doesn't matter which triangle you use to do this step. Um, and same thing happens with the Y. Now, what I, what I always do Again, you know, I try to when I I always try to be consistent when I do things. Down is always negative. It doesn't matter what we're doing. When I do these problems, I always make my triangle going drawing the X component first. Right. And so any force that has to be broken into its X and Y value, I always go X and then up to Y. If the force was in this direction, I would always go X. And then why? The reason why I would do that is because this puts the X component adjacent and you always use cosine. And the opposite, the Y component is opposite, so you always use sine. So I try to make it, I always try to do it that way so there's a little bit of consistency, um, you know, when I solve problems. But the danger with that is, is then the students, if you didn't really understand what I just said there, you're like, well, Doc always uses X with cosine. There's a reason for that because it's how I make my triangle, okay? So now you might just do this, what I wrote here, or you might take it one step farther, but you neither of these 
two steps need to be drawn, uh, meaning you might make yourself a new force diagram where you actually include, I'm just gonna call this FA, where you actually include the components like this, right? Because what we're essentially doing is we're taking this tension force away and we're saying the X and Y component are now taking its place, right? And so that might help you, um, you know, uh, better set up the equation than if you didn't do it that way, but it's up to you. But that's what you, that's ultimately what we're doing is we are, we're going to take that one force that acts at an angle and we have to break it into its, right, break it into its X and Y component. So we start out with that still, right? Just like we did for Newton's first law. Now we, we look at the situation, right? Whether or not you draw this or not, you've got to, you've got to realize that the tension force is acting in the X direction and the Y direction. So I know it is TX. I don't know why I did that. I know it is TX, right? And this is why you may want to do this because then you're, you're going right back to what we've already done Excuse me, and writing down the forces. So TX minus the force of air equals zero. TY is up minus the force of gravity is zero. Now, when you look at this, how many unknowns do we have? Well, we know that the mass of the bucket was 620 kilograms, which means the force of gravity is really not an unknown because we can calculate it. TY is an unknown. The air resistance is an unknown. TX is an unknown is an unknown. So in this step right here, we have three unknowns, but we only have two equations, right? You can't solve that in, in, in math class. I know you guys have learned that many times. So this is the, the trace step, right? In every one of these problems, we're always gonna go Newton's first law from our force diagram. Now we have to have a trace step. And the trace step is to make it so we go from three unknowns or four unknowns down to two unknowns. And this is where we get rid of this and we get rid of this because we don't really care what those values are, right? We want to know what this is or we need to know what that is so that we can all find this. So this is the trig step. Tx, right, is adjacent to my angle of 50. So I'm using this triangle and not the one that, because they gave me that angle of 40, Right? So even though they give you the angle, depending on what triangle you make, you may not use the angle that's given in the problem. So you got to, you know, you really got to um, kind of look at the situation. So I know, again, cosine of 50, right, is adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine of 50 is opposite over hypotenuse. Right? You guys learned that in, what, eighth grade? and you've used it. Um, and so that's the key step for this to go from these two equations to what we write next. Tx is equal to T times cosine of 50, right? So I'm gonna substitute in T cosine of 50 and Ty is equal to T times sine of 50. So I'm gonna substitute that in Right, this, you can leave it as FG, or if you want to, you can put in MG. That's how we calculate it, either or. Now we've gone from this step with three unknowns to T, unknown, same unknown. So that's just one unknown, second unknown, right? And now we have two equations with two unknowns. Well, how? so once you get it to this point, right? Imagine you're in eighth grade algebra, and your teacher gives you this. Solve for X and Y. That's all we're doing. The exact same math that we, you guys learned and have used for years, right? When we get to that point, but it's, it's just getting to that point and understanding how to get to that point because that's all we're doing from this point on is we're solving for X and Y. Now, 
here's got two unknowns in this equation. So obviously I can't solve for either one of these. So I wanna look at the y equation. This only has one unknown, right? So I'm gonna solve this for t, which means I'm gonna add mg to the other side, and then I'm going to divide by the sine of 50. Right, so T is gonna equal 620 times 10. And again, I already took care of the negative when I put the force of gravity in right here, so I don't do it twice. Divide that by the sine of 50. Six two zero zero divided by sine. Make sure your calculator is in degrees. All right, so I get eight thousand ninety three point five newtons. All right now, a lot of times the problem is going to ask for for both the this force as well as the air resistance force. Um, it didn't in this case, but we need that number to take the next step, right? Because we're looking for the force of the air resistance which means it's going to equal T times cosine of 50. So this value of T has to go in right there. So we can actually get our answer. 8093.5 times cosine of 50, which is 5202. Now, those of you that are really good at geometry, there's a there's a bunch of shortcut methods to doing this stuff. Um, and you, so I, every year I have a student or two that will will do these problems, and their work their work will look nothing like what I've just shown you, because you're going to just manipulate with the angles and the forces and use tangent and sine and cosine. And that's great if you understand that stuff. The problem is, is, you know, whether it's the EP test or whether it's in college and you're doing that in your physics or your engineering class, um, you know, yeah, you're, you're using Newton's first law and the idea of equilibrium, but this is how it's supposed to be done. Um, you know, it's always supposed to be done with the equation or the law and the concept and setting up the equations and showing your work. Like if you were an engineer working for, you know, um, Russell Engineering and you brought brought your work to me and it didn't look like this, I, I would be like, I'd be a little skeptical about what were you doing, right? You want it to be, you want other people to be able to follow your work um, because ultimately other engineers are gonna be working on the projects. And so your shorthand methods of doing things while they may make sense to you, they won't may always make sense to other people and they're not easily to um, explainable. Any questions on that one? Did you say something, Dakota? Oh, okay. All right, let me, I wanna at least do one more here. Um, I forget what I have there. That one's kind of similar to the one we just did. All right, let's do this one. So, you know, maybe you, uh, you're you opening up your own store and you got to hang a sign outside. And so you normally the angles would be the same, right? Um, whether if it's a chain or a rope, it's naturally going to find a spot. So the angles are about equal if possible, unless you've got it set up kind of funny, um, which could sometimes also happen. So the angles aren't the same, but I didn't want the angles to be the same. Oh, my coffee went cold, the thing turned off. Huh. So you have a sign with a weight of 35 Newtons. So that means if it's the weight of 35 Newtons, that means they've already multiplied M times G together, right? Instead of saying a mass of, of 3.5 kilograms, you gotta pay attention to the wording. It's If it's in Newtons, that's a force, that's the weight. That's the force of gravity. And so, I'm gonna say this one is 30 because it looks smaller than the one on the other side. And that one is 40. Okay. And we wanna know the, what is the force of tension in each support. So I might call this one T1 
and this one T2, or you maybe you want to use a different subscript for um, or a different variable to keep track of them. Right, but this is going to be 40 degrees. This is going to be 30 degrees. So that's my force diagram. Again, it's based off of Newton's first law and my two equations. That should be your first step you write down. Now remember, this is positive x. Right, this is positive y, negative y, negative x. So we, now we have two forces, right, that are not in the x or y direction. Now, because these aren't going to make a right angle, we're not going to rotate our axes at all. Normally, we only rotate our axes when we do inclined planes. Um, and so we're kind of stuck here. And so what you need to do, let's look at T1. T1 goes like this. All right, whatever you're calling T1. Again, this angle is 40. So I'm going to make, I'm always going to make my triangle like this, right? So I go X to Y instead of Y to X. And here's my angle of 40. And here is T1 Y and T1 X. Then I'm going to do the same thing for T2. Right, T2 goes that way. So I'm going to go to the left and then I'm going to go up. So that is T2X, T2Y. This angle is 30. Okay, so now you have, we have two two forces that we have to break into the X and Y component. All right, so now we look at our, making our equations. So for T1, I have the X component of T1 that's exactly in the X direction, right? So it's this. So again, you what you could do, I think, um, I don't know how many of you would actually bother to do this but you could make your force diagram with the components if that helps, All right? T1X, T1Y, T2X, T2Y, right? If we get rid of T1 and T2 and we plug in all the components, this would be the force diagram. This is really not, you would never see this written in a textbook or, um, is part of an example solution. Um, but if it helps you get the equations, then by all means do it, but always make sure you draw the real force diagram. If you had this on your AP test, they, they would not give you any credit for this. Um, and it, usually it tells you, do not include the components, um, but it doesn't, it may not always tell you. So I have T1 right to the right, and I have T2X to the left. Right, so the X component of each of these have to equal each other to make equilibrium in the X direction. Now in the Y direction, I have T1, Y, right? This component of T1 up, it's positive. I have T2, Y, this component, right? This also up, also positive. And those two, those two components of tension one and two are what, is supporting the weight, which we know is 35 newtons. So here's my two equations. Now, how many unknowns do I have? Well, here I have four, right? These are both unknowns. These are both unknowns. This is 35. You can't solve that. And that's again, where this next step, we have to use our trig relationships to get it from four down to two unknowns. You know, if, if you always make your triangle like this, then this is always gonna be with a, a cosine and this will always be with sine. And so hopefully, you know, the more you do it, the, the more you're used to it, 
you don't really need to write this step. Cosine of 40 is equal to T1X over T1. So to get rid of this, I'm going to substitute in T1 cosine of 40. Well, based on that same philosophy, cosine of 30 is going to equal T2X over T2. So this is going to be T2 cosine of 30 equals 0. Does that make sense? That's the, that's the step that throws people off, how, you, how we go from this to this, right? And it's just using sine and cosine. So for T1Y, right, it's opposite the angle, so I know it's sine. Sine of 40 is opposite over hypotenuse. So if I solve this for T1Y, let's do it in a different color. Maybe it separates a little better. T1 sine of 40, right? T1 is T1 sine of 40. So again, same philosophy, T2, Y is gonna be T2 times the sine of 30, right? Sine of 30 equals opposite over the hypotenuse. Minus 35 Newtons, Mg equals zero. But now we've gone from four unknowns to T1, T2, two unknowns, right? And that's the, that's the trig step right there. And you're always gonna have that whenever you have a force that's acting at an angle. Again, now we're to the point where we have two equations and two unknowns. Solve for X and Y, right? Now, looking at this, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick this one and I'm gonna solve for either T1 or T2. Doesn't matter which. Generally, I would, because that's a minus sign, I'm gonna bring this one to the other side. And that's how I would decide which one to keep on the left. Because ultimately I like things that would be positive instead of working with negative numbers. And I'm gonna then divide both sides by cosine of 40. Right, and so T1, this cancels off, is equal to T2 cosine of 30 divided by cosine of 40. And so I would plug in, see cosine of 30 divided by cosine of 40 is 1.13. So here's a relationship. Whatever T2 is, I know T1 is going to be bigger by 0.13, right? 13% bigger. Now, if you look at it, T1 is at the bigger angle, right? So the one, the force that's more towards perpendicular is going to take more of the force um, than the one that's at the smaller angle. All right, so now we've made this little relationship. So what I have to do is I have to substitute this right here, right? We want to get rid of T1 and I'm going to substitute in 1.13 T2. times sine of 40 plus, now at this point you could get rid of sine of 30, right? Sine of 30 is 0.5. You might just wanna put in and get rid of the signs and have the decimal equivalent. Um, that's it's really up to you because eventually you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to do that anyway. but I'll, I'll wait one step. Man, why does it keep doing this? I don't wanna to have to buy another pad. And you could bring the 35 to the other side if you didn't wanna have it equal zero yet. All right, but sine of 40 
times 1.13. You want to do that next. So sine of 40 is 0.6427. I'm going to multiply that by 1.13. And that gives me 0 0.726. You could round that up to 0.73. We're not going to worry about how accurate we write sig figs. Sine of 30 is 0.5, right? So that's 0.5 T2 equals 35 newtons. Add these two guys together, right? It's like 3x plus 2x, but we just were dealing with fractions, right? So that's 1.2, I'll round that, 1.23 T2 equals 35 newtons. Divide both sides by 1.23. And I get what 28.5 newtons. Once I get that answer, now I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it in right here so that I can get T1. Right? 1.13 times 28.5. I get 32.3 newtons. And so that's how much force is going to be in each of those um, supports, what, chains, or whatever they are. Right. So you can see, you know, it can get a little a little trickier when you have more more than one force that's acting in the x or y direction. questions on them. That's really as hard as they get. Um, we don't normally get more than, at our level of physics, we don't normally get more than two forces where we have to do that. And so that's is kind of sloppier, as complicated as, and there I wrote more steps than you, you need, right? I, I tried not to skip any steps in terms of showing the substitutions of the, with the trigs and stuff. But a lot of this stuff over here, right? You don't need any of this stuff, right? If you can, if you can go from this to just writing this step, um, you know, and then you can get rid of cosine of 40 or cosine of 30 is 0.866. You can put in 0.866 T2 and get rid of the cosines and sines and just be working with decimals. All right, any questions? Okay, um, well, we didn't get as far as I wanted to get, but um,